Backslash and MATLAB. By the way, if you haven't played with Backslash and MATLAB, you should, because it's amazingly cool. It does the entire first half of CS205A in one character. Uh, and, and this is why like 90% of numerical analysis researchers never look at linear solvers, because they don't have to. Right? Um, and in fact, in this little coding assignment I gave you, you're, you're welcome to use Backslash for any coding assignments that, obviously, if I'm asking you to implement part of Backslash, don't just put it in there. Yeah? But sometimes you don't get so lucky. Sometimes you write down your least squares energy or whatever it is that you're trying to minimize, and like, there just isn't enough structure you can take advantage of. But that doesn't mean you just throw up your hands and give up. Nope, in CS205A, we have to analyze all of these problems to death, no matter what their level of generality is. And, and so, in fact, uh, we, 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 we can generate some algorithms for solving these types of things. Now, a, a, a quick question for you guys is, have we already seen a numerically, uh, well, a rather, a nonlinear problem in this class? We have. Or Long, long, like where we had a quadratic Lagrange then? Right? Yeah, exactly. When you had this quadratic Lagrange multiplier, right? Like when you solved the eigenvalue problem, right? Remember one of those one of the one of the ways that eigenvalue problems appear is by minimizing AX such that the norm of X is equal to one. That constraint downstairs is a nonlinear constraint. It doesn't look like it, because we're used to seeing this in linear algebra class, but this is a nonlinear problem. How can you see that? Well, one way is remember the eigenvalue uh, uh, formula, yeah, ax equals lambda x. What are our unknowns here? This isn't a hard question. What are, what are the unknowns if, if I'm trying to find eigenvectors and eigenvalues? Well, I just told you that the eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Yeah? In particular, it's x and lambda. But what did I just do here? I multiplied two unknowns. That is against the rules if I'm doing strictly linear mathematics. So in fact, although we didn't really think of it this way, when we solve an, uh, an eigenvalue problem, we, are, we really are solving something nonlinear. And we know that, right? For example, we saw that there are several critical points of this energy, which can't happen for linear things because they're convex. So today, we're going to consider one sort of generic nonlinear problem, which is that somebody gives us some function from Rn to Rm, and our job is to find a root or a zero of that function. So in particular, we're looking for a, a, a point to x star such that f of x star equals zero. Yeah? This is going to be our job today. Uh, for example, we, we could pose uh, the, 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 the linear system solving problem as a root finding problem by writing down an energy like this. You know, how does this look familiar? Once again, right? we could call this f of x. Right? And then roots of this thing are exactly what ax equals b. But obviously, we don't get so lucky. Uh, when, when we're not solving the one, the one energy that we really like to solve in this class. Yeah? Now, we have to be a little bit careful when we talk about something so generic as root finding. Right? I haven't told you anything about this function f. Before we talked about very sort of regular things. By the way, do you guys know what I mean when I talk about regularizing assumptions and regular, you know, when I use the word regular, what I kind of mean just generically is well-behaved. Right, so like a regular function is one that's kind of, you know, differentiable, smooth, you know, low frequency, nice looking. Right? But in fact, if all I tell you is I want some function and I'm trying to find its roots, right? I think you guys can all probably think of applications of this. It's not hard. If we had some black box, I could just solve this problem. But sort of from the from the computational standpoint, we, we could have some really bizarre functions that we could feed into this software just to be mean. Now, obviously, you probably wouldn't actually put in some pernicious data like this, but it is useful to keep in mind that, that we might accidentally do this, even if the examples I give you are a little bit stupid. Right, so for example, let's say I write f of x like this, where whenever x is negative, I, I, I put a negative one, wherever x is positive, I put a positive one. What are the roots of this function? Darn it. Yeah? The values of this function cross zero, right? It started out a negative one, it ended up a positive one, but it's, uh, it never does it actually have a root. In fact, if I were being really evil, I could define functions like this, which show up in measure theory all the time, right? Which is every time x is a rational number, I give you negative one. Every time x is anything else, I give you positive one. Obviously, this function has a structure that looks approximately like this. <laughs> really, really dense, right? The rationals are dense in the real. It's everybody's favorite uh, fact from analysis class. Neither of these functions has roots, and if you put them into any standard solver, as you might imagine, the solver explodes. Now, you kind of expect it to explode like on a function like this, 
But if I have a function that, for example, has kinks in it, or, or maybe it has these jumps, but it still has a root, you have to decide what your conditions are on f in order for your, your software to be successful. And that's the point that I want to drive home. So usually when we talk about nonlinear tools, so we're going to start out with solvers, and then eventually we're going to talk about optimization, right? Like minimizing a function. Then usually what we do, instead of saying, we, we, we used to have a very strong regularizer on f, namely that it was linear or quadratic. Now we can't say that, but we still need to have some assumptions on our function, or else we can't expect to, to, to find a root. Yeah? I think this is a reasonable conclusion. So here's some typical regularizing assumptions that make the root finding problem tractable. For one thing, you might hope that f is continuous. I think we all know what continuous functions are, right? They're ones that can be drawn without lifting your pen from the page. And we're going to go back and analyze why can continuous functions in particular are kind of the least thing you need to solve a root finding problem. I should be careful, not the least, right? There are these really generic methods on like lower, semi-continuous, whatever the heck, but they're very specific to uh, certain very noisy problems. Making things slightly stronger, if, if continuity is enough, we could say that our function is Lipschitz. By the way, how many of us have heard the word Lipschitz before? I think this doesn't always come up in our classes. Yeah, a couple. So uh, Lipschitz sits somewhere between continuous and differentiable. The idea here is that there's some constant c, so that the distance between f of x and f of y is bounded by that constant c times the distance between x and y. Right? So this is sort of like saying, if I have some crazy function, by the way, the function does not have to be differentiable, then uh, you know, maybe my function kind of kind of looks like this, right? it's really noisy. Like has lots of little kinks in it and stuff. But if I take any two points and I measure the secant, right, I draw the little slope between those points, somehow nothing too crazy can happen. Yeah. And that's basically what the Lipschitz condition is. So it's, it's, it's a condition that looks sort of like differentiability. Like the usual picture is you kind of draw this little wedge of you know, the upper and lower bounds on the slope. Right? And the function has to live inside of that anyway. OK. So. What's even stronger than Lipschitz? Well, maybe our function is differentiable. That means pretty much what you think. Yeah, you can take the derivative, you can take it anywhere. And then finally, the, the sort of nicest condition, or well, not the nicest, but a very nice condition, is that your function is ck, meaning that you can take k derivatives. In fact, all those k derivatives are continuous functions. Right? There are even stronger assumptions that can make ultra fast uh, root finding methods. We're not worried about here. Cool. So you can see that we kind of have from, from from the most generic to the most specific list of different conditions we can put on a function to help our root finder uh, have some guarantees about its behavior. Right? You can see that without any of these assumptions, it's going to be really difficult to write an algorithm and say anything about it. Yeah? Okay. So today, we're only going to worry about functions from R to R. That is, they take in one number and they output one number. And that's already enough to see lots of the important themes that we're going to consider in our discussion of root finding. Yeah. This is obviously, if we were talking about linear algebra, linear functions from R to R are totally boring, but this can include things like cosine, sine, e to the x, I don't know, whatever your favorite thing, you know, in, in my research, for some reason, arctangent shows up a lot, who knows, or cotangent, too. All right, so we're going to kind of start at the most generic level and then start adding conditions on f that make it stronger and stronger and stronger and show that we can derive better and better algorithms for root finding. So our first condition remembers that f is continuous. We're not going to worry about this, uh, this funky uh, semi-continuous thing. No. So there's one really important theorem for continuity that is abundantly obvious when you kind of think about it, but if you try and prove it, it might be a little bit tricky. Um, and that's called the intermediate value theorem. And hopefully on homework one, remember when we were doing all those error bounds that, that everybody's unhappy with? The, uh, the error bones, uh, that, that little theorem that you proved about uh, at the products of things with s in them, uh, at least my proof involved the intermediate value theorem. What does the intermediate value theorem say? Well, it says that if I have a function, <coughs> we use f function, yeah? and we have, uh, so here's x, and here's oh, f of x. Oh, oops, no metric today. Uh, then what do we know? We know that if I have two points, like this, right, and I draw little lines to the y-axis, that every point in between on the y-axis is attained somewhere between these two points in it. 
Okay? Hopefully this is a familiar theorem for you by now. Basically what it's saying is that you're dragging your pencil along and you can't hope uh, you know, to somehow skip over some y value uh, to go from one space to the next. Yeah? This is called the intermediate value theorem. By the way, something to keep in mind is that proofs involving the intermediate value theorem become infinitely more hairy when you're dealing with functions that are not just on R. Right? This is a gotcha, right? Because you can't say that every point in every x, y pair, for example, if you, if you output two numbers, it's gets a change. Right? So you be a little careful about that. And you use it over. So we need some kind of starting point for our bridge finding algorithm. Right? So we're going to try and find uh, zeros for continuous functions. And a reasonable one is that we have two points, x equals l and x equals r, and the product of their f values is negative. So let's, let's see what that means. Like maybe I'll use one more color or something like that. Great. Yeah. Right. So here's a, here's a function, right? This is x and this is f of x. Yeah. Huh? All right. So what does it mean that the product of two numbers is negative? They have different signs. They have different signs, right? Either f of l is negative and f of r is positive, or the other way around. Yeah. So in particular, we know that there are two points on the x uh, rear, maybe let's do that. Here's L and here's uh, R. You can see there's, uh, there's negative and there's positive. Okay. Now, now, why do we put this condition? Well, we just wrote down the intermediate value theorem. And in particular, if f, of, 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 if f is negative on one side and f is positive on some other place, then we know somewhere between L and R, there's a root of f. Aha! We have an in. We have a way to find a root. Notice that if f weren't continuous, we couldn't say that. Remember our very first example of root finding, where you have this like little hop function? That doesn't have this property. But if f is continuous, it certainly does. So thankfully, just like a, sort of like binary search, we can write down a pretty obvious algorithm for finding root of f, and it is guaranteed to work. This is called bisection. Yeah? Uh, how many people have seen bisection before? Yeah, it's a reasonable thing. Right, so the idea here is you uh, ooh, use lots of colors. You compute the midpoint between L and R. I call this C for center. It's kind of here. Yeah. And you look at the sign of f of C. And you can see here that f of C is positive, which means that in fact, I know that there's still a root between this negative number and this positive number. So I just x out this right hand side, and so on. Right, so the next iteration is going to find here, right? So it's still positive, and we can get rid of this interval. The next one is going to put C here, finds a negative number, yeah? get rid of this interval, and so on. Right? So basically, at each step, we're just typing the, uh, the space in which we think that f has a root. Right? And we know by continuity that as long as we keep track of two points, one of which where f is negative and one of which uh, has f positive, that we've never kind of lost the root by accident. Okay? It's probably one of the easier algorithms we've covered to apply. So what do we do? Well, we have to be a little bit careful. We need to, uh, so remember that this is an, iter an iterative scheme. So we have to define when we're kind of happy with our answer. Yeah? So, so in particular, in this case, it's pretty obvious because you know that your root is between R and L. So you can say that you, you pick convergence when the space between R and L is sufficiently small. And usually the user will just say, like, the, the, you know, you just need to bracket the root between two things. Yeah? This is our first algorithm for root finding. By the way, an interesting sort of puzzle is if you can extend root finding to functions that output more than one variable at a time. Uh, and this is not a trivial thing by any means. Okay, important questions. Does it converge? Absolutely. Right? Because what do we know? Well, at every point in time, we have bracketed a root of our function, and at every point in time, we have divided our initial, our, our, our previous width in half. Right? So our little, our little bracket of where we think this root is gets smaller, smaller, and smaller, and smaller. Right? Follow the geometric series. We like geometric stuff because they get really small when your coefficient is less than 1. Yeah? So, yes. It converges unconditionally. Right? This is a vocabulary word. When you say something converges unconditionally, it means that there is no time when bisection can fail. <laughs> there is if you, you code it wrong, but, but in theory, it, it, it cannot fail. And this makes some sense, right? Because you're just bracketing these. Oops. And then the next question we can ask is, how quickly does it converge? Well, the analysis here is pretty straightforward, right? So usually when we talk about convergence analysis, what we want to do 
as we look at the kth iterate, right, the kth number that comes out of our algorithm, that's sort of the approximation of where we think the root is. So in this case, maybe that's just that center point, yeah? And then what we want to do is bound the difference between that center point and the actual root that you're looking to find, which is x star. Right? So what we can do is write down some number e sub k, which bounds that difference, and if we can show that e sub k goes to zero with some rate, then we can understand how fast this thing converges. Does that, does that philosophy make sense? It's pretty straightforward. Yeah, I think this is one of our sort of easier lectures. So, right, so what is the obvious uh, e sub k here? I think we can erase the SVD now. But it shouldn't be erased from the mind. It's very important. OK, uh, right. So, so we can define E sub k to equal the difference between L sub k and R sub k. And obviously, the distance between, between your, your current estimate of the root has to be bounded above by this, because this is the whole width of your bracket. Yeah? And since we're doing bisection, what do we know? Well, we know that E sub k is uh, less than or equal to 1 half e sub k minus 1, right? Because every time we're dividing our integral in half, and in particular, uh, this means what? Well, it means that our, 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 our convergence is linear, right? Why do I say linear? Because the uh, rate at which it goes down is, is linear in the previous time. Yeah. Cool. So that's sort of the beginning and end of the story for bisection, right? Bisection is a very effective algorithm. Uh, it converges relatively quickly, right? And now, now this is kind of a funny difference between uh, algorithmic analysis and numerical analysis. In particular, when we talk about bisection, we think of it as the worst possible scheme for searching for a root of a function. Whereas usually when you talk about binary search on a sorted list, you think of this as the best thing you can hope for, because it has log n time, right? And this sort of looks like log n time, where you have this factor of 1 half, and in fact it is the slowest root finding algorithm we know, but it is unconditionally convergent, which is nice. So the question is, can we do better? Right? We haven't really used all that much information about f. We have this humongously generic uh, way to solve uh, 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 equations of single variable. The answer, of course, is, is yes. And, and we'll propose a few of these strategies. So one thing we can do is change our problem slightly. And say that, that, that rather than looking for roots, we're looking for fixed points of a function. I define a fixed point of a function to be one where I put in the point x star and I get x star back out. It's a reasonable thing. It's called a fixed point because it only really happened when I put in x star. Yeah? Now, my, my first question for you is if I can find all of the fixed points of g, right, if I have an algorithm that takes in a function and just lists out all of its fixed points, for example, uh, do, have I solved the root finding problem? Okay, well, so let's, let's yes. think about this. Yes, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, and why is that? Well, let's say I want to find, uh, I want to solve f of x equals zero. Well, how can I change this to a fixed point problem? Well, one thing I could do would be to just uh, add x to both sides, yeah? So I say now f of x plus x is equal to x. Yeah? So in particular, if I define this thing here to be g of x, right, then what I'm really searching for is the point g of x equals x, which is exactly a fixed point. Right? So if I can characterize the fixed points of a function, in fact, I can also find its roots and vice versa. <laughs> yeah? Okay. So what would be a reasonable sort of algorithm you might guess for, for, for finding a fixed point? Well, one thing you could do, just kind of blindly, would be I just start with a random x, that's my starting point, and I just start hammering it away with a g. And certainly, if this algorithm converges, then it found a fixed point, right? Because if it converges, then that means that basically I'm putting in x's and getting the same x's back out, right? Now, there's not necessarily any reason why you should think this should converge, but, but, but if it did, then we'd be like home free, yeah? You know? So it's, it's worthwhile to consider this algorithm as a way to find fixed points and see when it might work. In particular, maybe I write down some, uh, some error number, right? So in this case, uh, I've defined ek to be just I take the current iterate of this uh, fixed point method, and I subtract off uh, the root, wherever that root might be. Yeah? And what do we know 
Well, so the root, well, in this case, I shouldn't use the word root. I should, I should say that the fixed point of G satisfies that, that, that G of X star is equal to X star. Right? So you can see the second line, I plugged that in. And by definition, right, this fixed point iteration algorithm that I wrote down, right, you know that XK is equal to G of XK minus 1. Yeah? So in fact, our error value is the same as the distance between G of something and G of something else. So if we're looking for cases where this algorithm might converge, right, probably you go back down to our table of regularizing assumptions, continuity probably isn't enough. But remember our second regularizing assumption was this Lipschitz thing. And what did Lipschitz say? He said that if you have some distance between G of two numbers, right, if G is Lipschitz, then this is related to the distance between X k minus 1 and X star. Right? That's the point of Lipschitz. So let's say that I plug in the Lipschitz condition. What does that tell us about life? Well, it says that this, this absolute value that I wrote down is bounded above by some constant c times the difference between xk minus 1 and x star. But of course, that's nothing more than the error from our previous iteration. Cute trick, huh? Because now, if this constant, the Lipschitz constant c, if he is less than 1, what do I know about this algorithm? It converges. Right? Because each time, I take my error and I multiply it by some number, some positive number less than 1. Right? And so, uh, yeah, so, so the fixed point iteration algorithm sort of philosophically can't do a whole lot worse than, 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 than the, the binary strategy that I discussed, right? Because each time you get sort of another multiple of C, you're just hammering away at the uh, distance between your solution uh, and, 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 and the actual answer, yeah? But of course, the, the, the question you guys should be asking is, well, okay, so this thing, you know, takes my error and multiplies it by some C. The last argument we just talked about took my error and multiplied it by half, so like, you know, why, why do I care? You know, I think that's a reasonable question. There are a couple of answers. Uh, first is that this also suggests that, that it might be useful for differentiable functions. Um, this isn't an answer in itself, because of course, bisection could be used for differential things as well. But uh, in particular, what we really care about is that your function is Lipschitz near x star with a good starting point. Right? So if you can show that, that, that g is Lipschitz with a very small Lipschitz constant near, near the root that you like, right, then you know the conversion will be very fast because the Lipschitz constant is what's telling you how quickly you're shrinking in on x star. Yeah? And there's one case that's particularly important here, which is that let's say that g is differ a differentiable, the fact that it's c1. And that at x star, his slope is less than 1. And the absolute value of his slope is less than 1. So what does this look like? This is some function, right? Here's the root. Here's, a, here's x star. Right? And his slope at x star is bounded by 1. So afterwards, he might do something crazy. But at least we know that at this root, nothing too weird happens. And since it's c1, what do we know about our function, about, about uh, this, this g prime? Well, we know that g prime, right, the first derivative, is a continuous function. That's what c1 means. It means that it's differentiable, that the derivative is continuous. In particular, what that means is that not only is the slope here less than 1, but in some neighborhood at this point, the slope is also less than 1. Does that make sense? So let's formalize this a little bit. All right, we'll uh, erase our high-level linear algebra stuff here. By the way, I talk about things you should experiment with at home, even if I'm not asking you to code. Fixed point iteration is a very easy one to experiment with and just look at when it works and when it doesn't. Right? It's like two lines of code, you should try it. Um, right. So, uh, yeah. So, in particular, we know g of x minus g of y. Um, and, and we're trying to bound this number in some neighborhood of x star. Right? And what we know right now is that mod uh, g prime of x star uh, is strictly less than 1. Right? That's going to be our assumption on g. And then what can we say? Then we can say that uh, this implies that for all x in some neighborhood, x star minus delta to x star plus delta, there exists some, some number epsilon 
such that. Now I'm going to parse this for you in a second. Don't don't get don't get don't get scared. Um, such that mod g prime of x is less than one minus epsilon. All right. So what did I just do? So what I said is that there exists some delta. We'll say he's bigger than zero. I guess I didn't say that explicitly. And basically, this is just some neighborhood around your root, x star, right? So here's x star, and now I'm drawing, like, you can think of this as x star minus delta, and this is x star plus delta, yeah? Right, so it's just a little neighborhood around your root. Well, we know that, that mod g prime at the root is less than 1, so all I'm saying is in this little neighborhood of your root, the, the g prime is also less than 1 in that neighborhood of the root. In fact, it is strictly less than 1 in the neighborhood of the root, so, so in particular, I can choose some epsilon so that it's, it's bounded by one minus this for some little itty bitty amount, right? So this is saying, so what I don't want to have to deal with is that the slope of my function approaches one, and something, might, something kind of weird might happen there. You see? So there's some number one minus epsilon, which is strictly less than one, that also up rounds the slope of my function near x star, is what I'm trying to say. I know this then is hard to parse. Basically what I'm saying my function is kind of like this and not like that. Yeah? Cool. All right. Well, if I can say that, then I can actually show that this fixed point iteration method is going to work in some neighborhood of x star, right? Because what can I say? Well, I can say g of x minus g of y, right? Well, uh, by, the, uh, by the mean value theorem, I know that this is equal to g prime of some theta between x and y times the difference x minus y. Remember the mean value theorem? It says if I take a secant between two points and I measure its slope, then somewhere between those two points, that slope of the secant is equal to the derivative of g. Yeah? So this is for some... I know this is covered in, uh, in uh, uh, AP calculus, but it's, it's been a long time, huh? Yeah? And what do we know? Well, I already showed you that, that I already told you that g prime in some neighborhood of x star is bounded above by 1 minus epsilon. Yeah? Right? So here's your Lipschitz constant in some neighborhood of x star. Right? So this shows that as long as you start close enough to x star and the slope of g at x star is very small, that in fact, uh, fixed point iteration is guaranteed to converge. Cool? Now, why do we care? Well, so far, I haven't, I, all we've said is that convergence is always linear. And in fact, if epsilon is very close to zero, then it's going to be not so great convergence, right? Because every time you're multiplying the width of your interval by 1 minus, a, by like 97% or something, right? It was guaranteed to make it to zero eventually, but it could take a long time. But in fact, that's not the case. In fact, convergence is often quadratic. And this proof is actually worth stepping through a little bit. <sighs> Let's hope that I don't flood it too much. I mean, it has any this okay. All right. So, in this case, we're going to uh, assume one additional thing, which is that g prime at x star is not just bounded above by one, but it is exactly zero. This is like the best possible thing, right? This is saying that you're finding root of a function, and right at the root, it's tangent to the x-axis. Yeah? So what can we say in this case? Well, let's take the Taylor series of g about x star. In particular, what we're going to say is that g, maybe we'll have that in xk, right, our current iteration, which we're going to assume is close to, uh, to x star, right? Well, he's equal to g of x star, right? Plus, well, g prime is 0, so we can ignore the first order term. That's going to be the trick. Yeah? Plus 1 half g double prime of x star times x, well, k minus x star plus big O of x, k minus x star cubed, right? Plus a cubic term. Cool? Oh, yes. Thank you. All right. So, well, what can we do in this case? Well, let's start simplifying our, our error value. Remember, so ek, he is equal to xk minus x star, 
this by definition, right? It's the between our current guess and the one that we're trying to find. Well, just like before, we can plug in that this is equal to g of x k minus 1 minus g of x star. Right? Same argument we use, or the same argument we used about Lipschitz stuff. What on here? What's going on outside? Um, and now, let's plug in our Taylor series. Right? So we're going to remove g of x star. But this is equal to x star, by the way, because it's a fixed point. Um, it doesn't even matter, because we've subtracted it. And what we get here is uh, do, 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 one half mod g double prime of x star times x k minus one minus x star squared plus big L of x k minus one minus x star cubed. Okay. Right. All I did was I took this guy and I plugged him into this expression. Yeah. And I can pull out this, uh, this double prime. Cool. Okay. So now what can I do? Well, I can cheat a little bit. Which is that, let's say that xk minus 1 is very close to x star. Right? In particular, this difference is going to be less than 1. That's fair. Right? At least you have to value this difference. And then what can I say about it? Well, I can say that certainly this cubic term is bounded above by, by some quadratic thing, right? A small number squared is bigger than a small number cubed. Yeah? And so by that argument, in some neighborhood of x star, I can actually just say something a little bit more convenient, which it is ooh, that this number is bounded above by 1 half. And now what I'm going to do is just add a little bit to g w, uh, g double prime for some number, whatever. Uh, times x k minus one minus x star squared. Right. So all I did is I took the cubic term and I said, well, as long as I'm close enough to x star, then I can just add a little bit to this positive number to absorb the small stuff that I had. And finally, uh, well, what do we notice? This number here is nothing more than e k minus 1 squared, and this thing looks like a Lipschitz constant. So in fact, my error, remember where I started? I started at e k here, and I wanted to bound him in terms of the previous error. And what I showed is that e k is actually less than some constant, right? This thing can be bounded above in a neighborhood of x star. Some constant times e k minus 1 squared. And remember, your error already is small when you start it out, because you kind of assume that you're close to a root. So when you square this number, particularly it's less than 1, yeah, you converge very quickly. In fact, this is called quadratic convergence. Right? So this algorithm behaves far better than just the general bisection strategy uh, when you can prove this nice bound on the slope of your function g. If you can't show this about your, the slope of your function g, like if g has big slope, then what can we say about fixed point iteration? Not a darn thing. In fact, it's likely to diverge. This is very, you gotta do your homework and make sure it's gonna work. Okay. Now, it seems kind of made up that I proposed this fixed point iteration thing, but I didn't really tell you like, like why, why should you expect to want to find a fixed point? And why should you expect the slope at the fixed point to be anything, anything that, that you might care about, right? It's a, uh, it's, this is kind of a, this is kind of an odd.